oh no, the scientists and the politicians, they've lied to us about COVID, whatever will we do? Let's take a look at just a few of the COVID conspiracy theories that weren't. You do realize that even if a conspiracy theory was proven true, by definition, it's still a conspiracy theory, right? Ten times that media, health officials, or our very own president were proven to have lied about the coronavirus pandemic. So as you can tell already, the creators of this video are heavily conservative and borderline conspiracy theorists. Actually, they mention the Wuhan laboratory again later, so I guess they are full-blown conspiracy theorists. They're really criticizing science because I represent science. That's dangerous. Experts and health officials promised in March 2020 that we needed just 15 days to slow the spread. Now, almost two years later, we've seen almost 700 days of mandates, lockdowns, quarantines, shaming, hysteria, and travel restrictions with no stated end in sight. What do we have to look forward to? As of right now, more mandates. Geez, I wonder why that is. It's because people don't comply with recommendations given by science experts. The longer we keep this up, the longer we will fight the virus. The more people that refuse to wear masks and refuse to get vaccinated, the longer the virus sticks around. It's that simple. It's funny that you're complaining about the outcome of something when it's people like you that caused this outcome to extend much further than it needed to. The sooner we all start putting in effort to reduce the spread, the sooner we can go back to normal life. Don't speak as if anyone likes the lockdowns. No one likes lockdowns. No one likes wearing masks in public. The difference is that the reasonable people recognize what needs to be done in order to end this pandemic. Right now in the United States, people should not be walking around with masks. You're sure of it? Because people are listening really no, closely to this. Uh, right now, people should not be walking. There's no reason to be walking around with a mask. During the early days of the pandemic, the CDC recommended that Americans not wear face masks, and the U.S. Surgeon General urged us to stop buying masks. But in April 2020, the CDC said that all Americans should wear face coverings to avoid transmission of the virus, sparking culture wars over mask mandates across the country, heavy shaming of those who chose not to wear masks, and viral videos of often violent confrontations between Americans. And that's not even touching the mask situation with children. This is not only a lie, it's also a misinterpretation of the situation. The reason the United States originally said that no masks were needed is because there was a heavy shortage of them. And Dr. Fauci in that video even said, as of now, there's no need for masks, because the situation hasn't escalated in the United States at that point to warrant the public wearing masks. Meanwhile, hospitals, which definitely are a hotspot of COVID patients, require them. And when people get paranoid and mass buy all the masks, that leaves none for the hospitals, especially N95 masks. But after a while, the supply has increased and the number of COVID infections skyrocketed. It was then a good idea to redirect some of this extra supply to the general public. Before, in March, the chances of you coming into contact with an infected person was low. Then, in the subsequent months, it was very likely. I have a feeling this video is going to be a lot of comparing what scientists or politicians said at different periods of time, then calling it a, quote, lie. Well, guess what? Things are always changing. As we obtain more knowledge and as the situation in the country changes, expert recommendations are going to change too. You'd have to be an extra special type of dense if you don't understand that. And now, most media outlets are reporting that cloth masks just don't work and we should try N95s. Again, information changes, not just what we know about the virus, but the virus itself also changes. It's been shown recently that cloth masks are less effective. That doesn't mean they're completely ineffective, but that N95 and surgical ones do the job better. You're trying to use this as an excuse to not wear masks at all, saying, oh, the experts can't get their information right, so masks must have no effect at all, when in reality, this is simply not the case. In December 2020, President-elect Joe Biden promised that he would not force Americans to be vaccinated. No, I don't think it should be mandatory. I wouldn't demand to be mandatory, but I would do everything in my power. Just like I don't think masks have to be made mandatory nationwide. But this year, the Biden administration did exactly what Biden said they would not do and mandated that healthcare workers and U.S. companies with more than 100 employees must get vaccinated. But that's not really a lie. That's more like Biden changing his mind. Originally, he said, I don't think there should be mandates, but that only talks about the present and not the future. That being said, I also think Biden had too much trust in the American people. Like, for real, have you seen the people that live here? Half the population are complete idiots. If it were me, I would have mandated vaccines from the very beginning because I would have predicted that many people wouldn't want to get vaccinated. You just have to assume people are idiots.
And now that Americans are seeing that the vaccinations don't fully stop COVID, more and more questions are being asked about why Biden is mandating vaccines. I don't know how many times I have to explain this to people. No vaccine is 100% effective, but having that 90% sure is a lot better than having 0%, wouldn't you say? Seatbelts only increase your rate of survival by about, I don't know, 45%, and yet you still put on a seatbelt when you drive. Seatbelts are also mandatory, and yet no one complains about that. Not to mention, you're a lot more likely to get COVID than to get into a car accident. It's crazy when you put this into perspective. Remember when we were all told that the coronavirus originated in a Chinese wet market? Republican Senator Tom Cotton was lambasted by the media for suggesting the coronavirus actually originated in an infectious disease lab, rather than an animal market, as the Chinese government claimed. Snopes called Cotton's claims speculative, the BBC called them unfounded, and the Washington Post went so far as to say that the lab leak theory was debunked. After New York Magazine published an expose highlighting the legitimacy of the theory, Many of those media outlets published stories confirming that yes, the coronavirus may have originated in a Wuhan lab. And now, we know that scientists consulting with the US government early in the pandemic believed that the coronavirus had originated in the lab. But Dr. Anthony Fauci worked to shut that hypothesis down. I can't believe it's 2022 and we're still talking about the Wuhan lab. Also, your language is stupidly pathetic. Confirmed that yes, this may have originally came from a Wuhan lab. Quote, confirmed and may have. What a way to make it sound more legitimate without going all in. Well, I also confirmed that you may be an idiot. If it's maybe, then you have not confirmed jack shit. First of all, the origin of a virus is indeed important because it can teach us lessons on how to prevent a future pandemic. However, the conspiracy theorists at this point are literally fishing this dead lake in order to find someone to blame. Okay, what if we tell you it did originate in a lab? Then what? Literally nothing changes for you. Okay, point some fingers at China, I guess, but this will literally never change your life in the United States whatsoever. People just like to assign blame to others. How about you focus on making yourself a better person, hmm? I'm sure there's lots to improve. That being said, we've had plenty of investigations on the origin of the virus already, but the DNA evidence is by far the strongest evidence we will ever have when it comes to viral origins. And of course, as expected, it came from bats, and it's incredibly, incredibly unlikely that it was manufactured in secret in an attempt to develop a bioweapon. I won't go into too much detail today since we still have a lot of video to cover, but you can inspect the DNA and instantly tell if it's been tampered with. Because in order to make a bioweapon, you'll need to meet certain criteria and you'll need to heavily manipulate the DNA, oftentimes borrowing and mixing from other organisms or viruses, in order for your manufactured bioweapon to be somewhat decent. And so far, all of the changes compared to already known viruses is consistent to the types of changes we expect. So that conspiracy theory is essentially debunked by DNA analysis already. Oh, but stick, what about if the Wuhan lab was just studying the virus and it leaked out? Okay, that's definitely more likely that the Wuhan scientists were just studying the evolutionary patterns of the coronavirus and a laboratory mistake allowed the leakage of the virus into the nearby wet market. Much more plausible, but still, there are laboratories all over the world studying all kinds of viruses. And of course, accidents happen all the time. Take the smallpox virus, for example, where in 1978, a case in the UK re-emerged due to a laboratory accident. However, just because it's possible that SARS-CoV-2 was the result of a lab leak does not mean it's probable. There have been plenty of virus leaks in the world, and not a single one resulted in an epidemic of a new virus. The only epidemic caused by a lab leak was in 1977 for the Russian flu, but definitely not to the scale of a global pandemic. SARS-CoV-2 is not only a new virus, it also scaled far beyond what is likely possible. Because the lab leak generally will only affect a small number of people, usually a single scientist that worked with the virus. From that, it's usually relatively difficult to spread enough to become an epidemic. Compare that to a natural origin where a virus was first allowed to spread throughout an animal population, such as bats, then the regular consumption of wildlife causes multiple people to be infected, that's definitely more likely. So although a lab leak of a natural virus is possible, it's so unlikely that, in my opinion, it's not worth even losing sleep over. And again, even if it was a lab leak, that literally won't affect your life whatsoever. Instead, focus on improving the situation now, rather than assigning blame to something that happened in the past. Activists, commentators, and teachers unions argued throughout 2020 and 2021 that schools should close out of fear of spreading coronavirus cases from child to child and child to teacher. Though multiple studies suggested that COVID does not easily spread among children and being in school settings doesn't create outbreaks. One commentator in an Atlantic piece suggested that school closures could result in flexible, adaptable, and resilient kids, sparking heavy backlash from conservatives. Now, after months and even years of children missing school, 
Even the New York Times is publishing stories warning that closing schools would be a tragic mistake, recognizing that hospitalization and death is uncommon in children. Here's the thing about conspiracy theorists. You guys never ever read scientific papers, and instead will always go to secondary sources, blogs, forums, or anything else that is opinionated. And of course, the situation on closing down schools is also opinionated, and since it's an opinion, you can't really lie about it. So I don't know how this even made it to the list of 10 lies, but whatever. Personally, I'm not against opening up schools, but I do think that precautions need to be made and masks need to be worn. The one article I do want to scrutinize a bit is this one, which says that children under 10 are unlikely to spread the virus. First of all, the study concludes that children 10 and over were still able to become infected easily. So I guess if we were to follow this article's advice, we would still close down all schools except elementary schools. Second of all, I went into the original paper and it says children 0 to 9 had the lowest rate increases of incident rate ratios and test positivity rate ratios. These are two measurements that are deduced from obtaining the virus. It doesn't necessarily draw conclusions about spreading the virus, because we already know that children are less likely to be infected, less likely to develop symptoms and less likely to die from COVID. The question is, can they spread it as easily? And I don't think this paper necessarily claimed anything about that. In the discussion, they said, this suggests that children in this age group do not have substantial rates of SARS-CoV-2 infection during school attendance. That's fantastic, but we already technically knew that. The question isn't their infection rates, but the rate of spread. The sentence later on goes to say this is supported by previous data that demonstrated lowered infection rates and lower transmission potential of this age group. The reason they say transmission potential is because the studies don't claim anything about transmission, only infection rates, which are two very different things. But just to be sure, I went and also read the reference papers, and none of them ever say they found lower transmission rates specifically by children under 10. Of course, if children are less likely to be infected, they're probably going to transmit less, but the two are not necessarily one-to-one -one since transmission can happen without testing positive. Positive. Overall, what I'll say is that we don't know for sure. Children are possibly more likely to transmit less, but there's not enough evidence out there to convince me. That being said, there are plenty of studies out there, not just this one from Israel, that has observed incidences of infection rates compared to school openings, and how well kids receive and potentially transmit the virus to other people. Don't forget that just because kids can transmit less does not mean they don't transmit at all, which is a huge distinction since this conspiracy theorist here is trying to imply they don't transmit at all. Anyway, the CDC is a great place to start, and they usually cite very good sources. Children and adolescents can also transmit SARS-CoV-2 infections to others. Early during the COVID-19 pandemic, children were not commonly identified as index cases in household or other clusters, largely because schools and extracurricular activities around the world were closed and no longer held in person. However, outbreaks among adolescents attending camps, sports events, and schools have demonstrated that adolescents can transmit SARS-CoV-2 to others. Furthermore, transmission studies that have examined secondary infection risks from children and adolescents to household contacts were rapidly, frequently, and systematically tested demonstrated that transmission does occur. So it seems that even if you prove children transmit less, it doesn't mean they don't transmit at all. Which means taking precautions in schools or school shutdowns is a perfectly valid strategy, since kids will be in contact with their peers, teachers, and their family members. It being worth it is a separate question. While I don't have a strong opinion about keeping schools open or closed, since technology has made online classes so much easier these days, it is at least a bare minimum that we enforce masking requirements and social distancing. Oh, would you look at the time, we'll managed to get through five, so let's tackle the other five another time. Thank you to my patrons, Fireshard, Alan Morton, and Miss Fixit. Stay safe, everyone.